So before I, before I invite Minister Ray, Ray's been a pastor for a long time and functioned for, as an active pastor many years ago, right? So he's been ministering, okay. He's been ministering in different ways over the past several years. And about a year and a half ago, about, we made, we, we reinitiated contact. We were friends for a while, but we reinitiated contact about a year, year and a half ago. And he wanted to share with me what had happened to him and why he had been sort of off the scene for, for a long time. And he shared this incredible miracle with me. And I knew I had to, to get him to share this with you at some point. And so with COVID, we've been on and off and hadn't been able to get him here to share this miracle with you. So this morning, he's gonna share it with you. Now, Ray comes from the Nazarene, Nazarene Church. And the Nazarene Church, by and large, are not Pentecostal, as we, as we think of Pentecostals. They're spirit-filled, spirit-led, of course, but the whole thing of miraculous healing and so on, it, it's, it's sort of downplayed quite a bit in, in the Nazarene Church, uh, but not with Ray. Ray has always believed for healing and miracles, but a year or two years ago, he had this incredible experience and he's gonna share it with you. Now, before he does, I need to share with you what his miracle, his testimony did for me. We know that we had a difficult trip to Israel last year, 2020, very difficult trip in many, many ways. Now, I got sick on that trip, really sick. Before we went to the trip, I mean two days before we left, I met with Ray and he shared more of that testimony with me. We went to that restaurant and, we, and the other brother was with us. Uh, that was two days, or two or three days before we left for Israel. On the way home from meeting with him, after he shared his testimony, I got a call from Hannah Nell saying, you can't be at Kedumim. On the way home, just after we met, that you can't be at Kedumim because of COVID. So this is two days now before so I knew that, that Israel was going to be difficult. I didn't know how difficult. And I didn't know that his testimony was going to sustain me in that period. Now, you guys, I don't think you fully understand just how sick I was. To understand how sick I was, you need to talk to Jim and Goethe, who saw me resolve to die. I resolved at the airport in Ben-Gurion that I was gonna die, that's how I felt. I had a blockage in my upper intestine. I had to get on the plane, COVID was rampant. All of, the, all of the, the, the excitement about COVID was all over Israel in every airport and here in the States. I had a blockage in my small intestine and I was not feeling good at all. In fact, like I said, at the, at the Ben Gurion airport, I sat there and I said to Lisa, there is no way I can travel like this. I don't know what's gonna come of me, but you get on the plane and go home. Leave me here. And again, I was prepared to die. I was prepared for the worst. So uh, I had help from a couple of people and I had a temporary relief. It was temporary. I had a tremendous blockage. Really bad things were happening <laughs> in this area right here. So I managed to gain the strength to get on the plane. I got on the plane. It was a real miracle that I managed to make it all the way back here. It, absolutely a miracle. Because I got on the plane at Ben Gurion, sick as sick can be. I recovered on the plane. By the time we got to Warsaw, where we had to make a quick connection to Chicago, where we would spend nine hours at that airport. And I'm sick, I'm dying. I can't show that I'm sick because of COVID. So suddenly on the plane going to Warsaw, I recover about 80%. I'm saying, hmm, this is good. Had some really bad experiences on the plane that I'm not gonna talk about, but okay, I'm not feeling quite as sick. I got to Warsaw, really not feeling well, but still not feeling as sick as I was. Got to Chicago, I had the strength to line up for nine hours, sick as sick can be. As if, as if God gave me what I needed to make it through the airport, and I did. As soon as I got to Orlando, 
the sickness, whatever it was, ramped up about 100%. And I was in a really bad state. So, so, I, so I went to the hospital, the emergency. <laughs> I'll share this with you just for the sake of testimony. Before I went to the emergency room, I went to, the clin I went to a clinic up in Oviedo. And this is a true story. I can get records for you. I don't have to do that because you'll believe me. So I went to the clinic, and the, the, the doctor there who was there, she looked at me and she said, mm, this, you've got something really going on here, so we want to do a quick x-ray of you and send you off to the hospital. That's the procedure, right? To send the x-ray before you get to the hospital so they will know what to expect. So they x-rayed me, technician came in, brand new machine, brand new machine, put me up on the table, lay me down, and the technician is behind the screen. And as he x-rayed me, I heard, him, I heard him gasp. I said, no, that can't be good. <laughs> but at that point, folks, I was resolved to die. I felt like I was dying. But I heard him gasp. And then he mumbled something, and then he went out, came back in, said, I need to redo the, uh, the x-ray. All right, so I, I, he lay back down on the bed, he did it again. And then he gasped again. This time he sent for two other people who came in the room and they're talking about the x-ray perplexed. Now I'm, I'm saying, okay, all right, whatever. I'm in your hands, God. He comes into the room and he says, something really strange has happened to the, to the x-ray machine. There's a glitch, he says, because we're seeing a foot on your stomach. We're seeing a foot on your stomach. Literally a foot. So I kind of looked at him like, what? He says, yeah, come and see it. So I hobbled around the screen and looked at it. Yes, there's a foot about a size 11 on my stomach. I mean, a foot. Literally a foot. An x-rayed foot. The technician said, something's wrong with the machine. It's a brand new machine. It's glitching. We're going to have to do this again. We don't understand it, but something's wrong. Of course something's wrong. There's a foot on my stomach. <laughs> So they did it a third time, and by then I'm really beginning to see what's going on, and I'm praying, I'm interceding. And I said to Satan, I said, Satan, your foot does not belong on my stomach. My foot belongs on your head. <laughs> now I'm praying that as they're doing this third x-ray. And the third x-ray came back, and he came out and said, okay, it's clearer. We don't see the foot, but there's, there's something wrong with the x-ray. There's something wrong. We can't understand what's going on, but we don't see the foot. All right, so we're going to send you off. We don't see the, ah, he said, all we can see is that your small intestines are dilated, which can mean a blockage. So the foot wasn't there anymore. All right, now I knew that this was spiritual, that I was in a spiritual battle, and God showed, God caused that foot to appear upon the x-ray, to illustrate to me that the devil was working to kill me. Amen. So when I, by faith, I said, no devil, your foot does not belong on my stomach, my foot belong on your head. That began the battle. And so the x-ray came out without a foot. <laughs> not clear, but without a foot. I don't believe anything was wrong with the machine. No, it's a brand new machine. The technician seemed to be really well trained. So I went to the hospital, they did my blood pressure, it was through the ceiling, of course, it's through the ceiling. Look at what I'm going through here. So they sat me down, and then came Boris, the Russian doctor. <laughs> His name wasn't Boris, I call him Boris. He wasn't Russian, he was Bulgarian, but he behaved like a Russian. This guy was knife happy. He just wanted to slash me open right away. He said, uh, you, you have a blockage there somewhere, we're going to send you here, we're going to do this, x-ray this, c CT scan. All he saw was doctor money, you know, all he saw was doctor, doctor salary, bills, that's all he saw. Uh, and then, so they, I'm here, I'm there, this test, that test, this test, they take me up to the room, they said, your small intestines are extremely dilated. We don't know what's happening with you, it's very strange. We're going to have to examine you, test you. And more than likely, we're going to have to cut you open. <laughs> I like what he said. Well, it's a small cut, a little incision. And then he did this. 
I said, no, you're not going to cut me open like that. No, no. I said, listen, doctor, you keep me here as long as you need. Keep me here as long as you need. This is going to be rectified. So I went in on, I went in on a Shabbat, a Saturday. By the way, I spent exactly seven days there. I came out on the next Shabbat. Those seven days were nothing short of just pure spiritual warfare. A lot of people believe that they're spiritual warfare giants. You're not a giant until you fight a battle like that. Amen. Now, I'm fortunate, I'm blessed that God had equipped me for such a battle. Brother Ray came in at that time, and he reminded me of the miracle that God had performed in his life. And so it gave me the strength. Because of his testimony of what God did, I was able to say, God, you are doing something here that's eternal, that's powerful, it's a testimony you're going to win for yourself. And over the next several days, well, week, seven days, the condition went away. Now, it didn't go away until the fifth day. On the fifth day is when everything normalized. Along the way, this, this doctor, Boris, I call him, he was just determined to cut me open. He was just... At one time, he got so furious with me that he said, you know, you're going to die if you keep this up. It's threatening me that I'm going to die. Worst possible thing, I'm going to die a horrible death on this bed if I don't allow him to slash me open, cut off, cut off about two feet of my colon. That's what he was after. And I was determined that God was going to heal me. And I remember walking the aisles of the hospital for hours, just walking up and down and praying, engaging in warfare, coming against the devil, standing on God's word. And one night, God said to me, as I'm sitting there, eat something, which was totally against the doctor's orders. Just put something in your mouth, eat it. So I ate some, uh, what, what was the worst possible thing I could have eaten, which was some tangerines. And tangerines, what are they called? Mandarin. 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 Mandarins. Acidic, <laughs> which from the doctor's point of view, from a normal, natural point of view, was the worst thing you can do. Well, let me tell you what. Those mandarins worked me over completely. The first thing in my stomach for at least six days after such a revolution in my stomach, mandarins. Two containers of it. But I, I knew something in me told me that I needed to put something in my stomach. The mandarins was perhaps exactly what I needed. Because some, something in the mandarins jump started me. It was painful. It was difficult. I was going both ways. If there was a third way to go, I would have gone. <laughs> Until finally, something went click in me. And the next morning, my upper colon was, was smaller. Smaller. By the next morning, which was the sixth morning, it had got back to his normal size. Boris came into the room. He says, he, he, with the, after studying the x-ray, he comes into the room. And he's angry. I mean, he is visibly livid with Lisa and I. He, he, I think he thought that Lisa had something to do with this. <laughs> he's livid now with Lisa and I because he's seeing his money opportunities fly away. And he was, he was shrill. He was angry. I should have sued him, but no. He was shrill, he was angry, and he basically said, you must have had toxins. You're okay, okay, all right, okay. And he leaves. So God healed me, and it was a fight until that fifth day. I mean, it was touch and go. I felt really bad, and I knew something in me said, I'm not afraid of the knife, but something in me said, don't let him cut you. Don't let him cut you. And I fought that, I fought it, I fought it, and I was healed. Now, Ray came up and visited me at the time, and many of you, some of you did as well. It was a battle, and Ray's testimony, what he's going to share with you now, was part of the strength that God gave me to overcome those seven days of real embattlement. That the devil wanted to take me out. He, he saw an opportunity to remove me, and the trip to Israel was tough. It was grueling tough <laughs> on many levels. But God brought a victory. 
God brought a wonderful victory. And so I want to invite Minister Ree up here, Pastor Ree, to come up and share his testimony. So, go right ahead. Praise God. By the way, I was going to ask for a favor if they could blow that horn, but we can blow that after this. If I am speaking a little weird, it's because I'm hearing myself, and I have to lower my hearing aid. I'm almost 70 years old, and so it's incredible that I have this hearing aid now that I can hear, but now I can hear people whispering about me. I should have warned them when I was a pastor. Because I couldn't know who was talking about the pastor. You understand? So, can you hear me? Talk to something. Hello? How do you stand up and back on? Can you hear me in the back? Yes, yes. Or we can hear you online. They used to call me Pastor Big Mouth. <laughs> okay, great. If it, if it goes over. <laughs> hey, uh, and I just wanted you to know that I have, I'm honored to be here. I did not know that part of the story. I only answered a call from a brother, a friend, someone that I loved. It was COVID. They didn't want to let me in the hospital. Is that better? <laughs> Can you stay with me? <laughs> I got an official mic holder. Anyway, <laughs> and so I want to tell you this. Everyone told me, are you crazy? You're going there. The nurse downstairs saying, you know, you, you shouldn't be here. I said, <laughs> nor should you. <laughs> but I work here. But I work for God. And so she thought I was crazy, which I probably am. Hey, before we go any further, I have a little thing I do, Pastor. I rescue pa Bibles. I go to the Goodwills. I go to the thrift stores. And people have Bibles they give away and they think, and guess what I do? I go rescue those Bibles and I give them to someone. I rescued this Bible, had not opened it, Pastor, and I opened it when you were praying for healing. And look at where I opened it that was already there. Can you read it for me, Pastor? How much you want to read? That one on the blue, only the blue. He has injured us, now he will bandage, bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us. We will live in his presence. Who doesn't have a Bible? Do you have someone you want to give a Bible to? I'm going to leave it in this church. It belongs here. Okay? So I bring this gift. If someone ever comes and doesn't have a Bible, you know where they get to get them. That God gave it for someone in this Bible. I brought it here. And I opened it and I almost fell over when he was praying the healing, okay? Now let me, let me tell you, I told him before you start that 15 minute pick, because I'm, I'm a preacher and you gotta be careful with preachers. I'm not Pentecostal, I'm a Nazarene. We believe in holiness, we believe in healing, but we don't practice it. We don't practice a lot of things in church. We claim we are one thing and do another. Okay? I never preached a sermon on telling people to get healed. Yet in my church, I started, and, and just so that you know real quickly, I'm a high school dropout. I grew up in Brooklyn. I slept and boarded up buildings. My mom was a prostitute and a drug addict. And I slept in the streets of Bedford Stuyvesant. I say that not to belittle or hurt my wife. <laughs> I think he just wants to like me. Anyway, so here we go. So this is how I just wanted you to know that. Because I also, like Paul, can glory on all the things God did with my life. A high school dropout to become a PhD. How in the world you explain that? Not only a PhD, but I became a forensic psychopathologist after being a theologist. I mean, I have a theology degree. And so in that backdrop, when the moment comes, when God has to come into your life and say, this is your moment, 
No theology, no psychology, no anything. Not your education, not any of those things can save you at that moment of death. Mm-hmm. And guess what, my friend? We're all going to die. Whether the Lord comes now or he comes tomorrow, we're going to die. And when Jesus comes, this body will die. You won't take this body with you. It's corrupt. We will become from the incorruptible, I mean from the corruptible into the uncorruptible. Do I hear an amen on that? Amen. Do I sound like an Nazarene? No, I am no Nazarene no more. You know what I am? I have been redeemed, restored, and revived from the dead. Amen. You know who's talking to you? Lazarus. So, Pastor, now I'll get into my and my story. So here I am. I had left the church. I became a forensic psychopathologist. I worked with homeless. I worked with gangsters. I worked with kids. I was trying to somehow save the world because the church had abandoned that message of salvation where I believe that a man needs to be born again, that a man needs to have a different lifestyle, that change comes by our involvement in people's life. And so I left the ministry. I left it because, not because of problems with the church, because I felt that I could do more. And so I worked with kids in the street with gang members. I worked because that's where I came from. I'm from New York, multicultural. And so I speak five languages. So how I prepare is that God said, wait, wait a minute, hold on, come over here. And I have seen lives transformed in penitentiary. I worked in Lake County, Penitentiary. Well, it's a state prison in, in Lake County up there, if you know about that, right off the, the Hot 75. And they appointed me to the psychiatric unit. So my wife says, are you crazy? I said, I guess all we can continue the psychiatric unit. <laughs> <laughs> must be. It must be true. And so I worked, and I've done my work, and I've done my service, and I've served God, I've served the church. Then I became a regular member, no more preaching. I would sit and listen to sermons. Why don't you preach? When God wants me to preach, I'll preach. I'll live my life first. And then one day, in the quietness of my life, thinking that I was done. Oh, by the way, I just got to tell you, Pastor, before that, I had a major car wreck. It was fatal. The car destroyed, head-on collision, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm just simply saying that I have for you, I want you to watch this, all my medical records, in case no one believes me. I'm going to show you something here. My discharge papers, pastor, seven days, seven days, right here. I was admitted on Wednesday, December 11th. I was discharged. Hallelujah. On December, the day of December 22nd, which it was Hanukkah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was there three days, and then they did the first, and then on the no, seventh, they, they discharged me, and it was Hanukkah. I want to tell you another, another subject that you got to hear. Listen to this. My grandmother's name was Apollonia Maccabeo, which is Maccabean. I discovered my heritage that I am a Jew, but not a regular Jew, a warrior Jew. Oh One that came to the temple to rescue the temple from all the perversion that the people of Israel. I'm not that person. I'm just simply saying that that's my blood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a Puerto Rican. No. Yeah. <laughs> my mom, my grandmother was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Oh, there you come again. <laughs> If you can't hear me, let me know. Okay, I can always talk loud. But let me let me let me tell you why I say that. When I discovered that my family had abandoned the faith and that I was a Nazarene and I believed in holiness, I discovered that I am a Jew first in my heart, not in my flesh, but in my heart. And so I lived that life, and I thought I was doing good. Doctor Wayne. I don't want my Chris there. At one point, I went to 228 pounds. He told me, Ray, you better start exercising. Blood was fine, no problems with my health. I was in good shape. He said, but you have a little belly going on in there. You need to start exercising. So I started running again. Running, you know, here I am, 60-something years old, running upstairs, running downstairs. There were young women saying, you look better than my husband. I said, you better stay away from me. <laughs> I'm going to run away from you. <laughs> and so this is what I was doing. And as I was running up the stairs, I heard a pop. 
Now I have, at one time, I had a torn Achilles tendon. Now that's painful. And so I felt that pop in my leg. I said, oh, not the another, another Achilles tendon on the left side now. So I put ice, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. My leg had swelled up. My wife says, you got to go to, to a doctor. That don't look right. My wife was a nurse and taught med med uh, nursing in school and college. My daughter works as a specialist in cardiovascular disorders. And so she called him and she said, you know, he should go to the ur urgent care. Urgent care doctor looks at it. He said, oh my goodness, you better go to the emergency room. I don't know what that is. So I go to the emergency room. I hop like this because I, I don't drive, right? So I, <laughs> I'm walking around. I sit in the emergency room. They take my blood test, my blood. They see every, uh, my uh, blood test or, you know, uh, they do a blood. They, they look at my monitor, they take a e EKG, everything looks good. They take an x-ray, just a regular x-ray of my chest, everything looks good. So they sat me for three hours, I waited at East um, in, uh, Lake Underhill, at Ben Hospital. Three hours I waited there, three hours sitting there. When I come in, they sit me in, the, in, a, in, a, in a room, here comes the doctor, my blood test comes in, he looks at everything, he said everything looks normal, your pressure is fine, do you have chest pain? No, do you have you shortness of breath? I said, no, I could go home. I was walking around the place talking to people. Hey, do you know Jesus? And people are going, yeah, if it's I said, no, not that, it's who I'm talking Jesus, you know? And so it was simple. I felt nothing. I was fine. Not a sign of anything. Doctor comes in. The second time, and he says, listen, I looked at the x-ray, but I'm not sure if I should let you go. Let do, let's do an ultrasound of your leg. He does an ultrasound from here to my groin. Guess what they found? A massive blood clot <laughs> in my groin. And he says, oh, we better check that out. Let's take a CAT scan. Sends me for a CAT scan. Guess what they find? they find that 80% of my lungs are completely clogged with a major catastrophic blood clot. Catastrophic. And he says, uh oh, we're gonna have to keep you here and get a cardiologist and get all that, you can't go home. But everything was normal, everything. I was walking around, nobody told me not to walk around. And nobody told me to stay in the chair. I'm walking around, I mean, in the bed, I'm walking, going here, going there, talking to people. And guess what, the pulmonologist comes in the morning, he sees me walking, I said, where, he says, where are you going? I said, all oh, the hospitalists told me they can't do anything for me, so they're gonna give me heparin, and they're gonna send me home, it's a blood thinner. He says, you're going home. And he goes like this, his name is Muhammad Ali, he's a Muslim. He looks at me and says, young man, I said, don't call me young man, I'm almost 70. He says, young man, you get back in that bed and call the nurse. If you don't tie this guy down, he's going to drop dead right there. He's going to die. Like that. Now, that caught my attention, right? Whoa, they're going to tie me down. And I lay down in that bed. When my wife came, he was still there, and he says, you're his wife? This man is going to die. How many doctors talk to you like that? I had one. Oh, you had one. <laughs> I'm telling you, you and I, we should go on the rope and just, no, I'm kidding, that's no, I'm kidding. But, but I am telling you, listen to me. I never had a doctor ever tell me that. They call me fat, they call me, but never they told me I'm gonna die right there. And so guess what? My daughter, I hear her, coming to visit me, and she's a specialist in cardiovascular disorders, but she's not a medical doctor. She trains surgeons in surgery with equipment that she works for a company that designs equipment to take care of things like this. Isn't that a miracle that I had a child who became an expert in cardiovascular diseases, and I never thought that I would need her one day because I was in a, dead in a, in a deathbed. You see, God knows every step we take, and nothing that happens to us, Pastor, is by accident. I wasn't there because of some crazy moment in time, bad luck. 
I was there because God had me there, and he had me for a purpose, whether I live or not. So my daughter's praying. Oh, no, I'm going to call Barry. Let me tell you, the names are there for you to see. Dr. Barry Weinstock, Dr. Ali, I got their names, cardiologist, pulmonologist. She calls Barry, and guess where Barry's at? He's in New York. Why? Because he's Jewish, a non-believing Jew. I've known him for 20 years, Pastor, 20 years, and he doesn't believe in Jesus, okay? He does not believe in Jesus, but he married a Christian, and she's always telling him about Christ. And he says, I'm a Jew. We don't believe in that man. He's a, he's a false god. And Barry from New York looks at the records and calls Jessica. Jessica, I'm going to have to go down there on, a, on a, what they call a red eye. A red eye. He gets on a red eye. Shows up by my bed. That night, I was so happy. You don't understand. May God strike me dead if I'm about to say something that is not true. I have never had more joy and joy unspeakable and full of glory than the night they told me I was going to die. I knew that one day I would see my Redeemer. How dare you take me away? For I, have, I, I was born for this moment. I'm going to see Jesus, the greatest thing that had ever been in, in, in this planet, in this universe. I'm going to see the creator. Don't you dare take me away from this death, deathbed, I said. There were pastors coming to anoint me and praying and all that stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm praying for you. Where I'm going, I don't need any prayer. I wasn't being boastful. I was full of the Holy Spirit. I was outright crazy. I needed a psychiatrist. But that's how I felt because I never felt the joy. Look, I've been a pastor for 35 years. I've preached sermons. I've seen things, but never had it, I experienced the joy of the Lord like in that moment when they told me I was going to die. <laughs> so that night, I closed my eyes and I said, Lord, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, my Lord and Savior Hashem, into thy hands I commit my life, my spirit, and I'm all yours in a quiet prayer, and I closed my eyes, and I saw the hands of God in my head. Not, not, not if I was seeing the hands of God, call somebody, but it was in my, I saw it. Guess what? I did not see the wounds in his hand. I did not see them. It was just the hands of God. And as I looked, I said, Lord, with joy in my heart, take me as I am. Take me home. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. It's time for me to go home. Take me home. Please take me. Well, you know, God sometimes doesn't listen to our prayers. He didn't want to listen to my prayer that day. He said, that's not the prayer I'm listening to. So the next morning... Walks in Barry Weinstock. He said, Papa, you're in a catastrophic event. Now, this is a friend talking to me. Not a doctor trying to make money. You're in a catastrophic event. And you only have a 20% chance of surviving the procedure we're about to do to see if we could give you just that little bit of a chance. I said, Barry, don't you dare try to save my life. He says, Ray. He didn't call me Papa. He said, Ray, you better do what I tell you <laughs> because I'll tell your daughter, and you know she's the little monster of the family. I says, okay, Barry, whatever. They took me into an immediate procedure where they would put a tube up, and you guys may be familiar with that, and they try to put a, a tube that has some kind of vibration and it's supposed to do this and supposed to do that. But before they did that, they did a Doppler. Anybody knows what a Doppler of the heart is? My heart has grown three twice the size. It had overgrown and enlarged twice the size. And guess what they found in the heart? They found a blood clot. Now they're saying we're racing against time. That blood clot goes to the brain. What happens? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you what happens. You know what happens. And so I went to the procedure. And they said, we're going to put you to sleep. And they put me in the twilight. I could hear him talking about me. I thought, when I wake up, I'm going to tell him I've heard everything they said about me. 
And so they put me in the machine for 16 hours, laying down, I couldn't move, I, my, my, my prostate had enlarged, I, I couldn't, I, I was bad, bad situation. The worst situation you could think. And I couldn't move, my back, my back went numb. I couldn't do anything. And I couldn't move in the machine. And I still said, Lord, I wasn't messing around, take me home now because I'm ready right now. <laughs> this is torture, okay? Barry comes down, it was late at night, and he says, Ray, I'm going home. I've been here all day. I'm gonna go take a little nap, have a little lunch, and I'll see you tomorrow by one and see what the results are, but they're gonna take a CAT scan. And they're gonna take a full body with contrast CAT scan, and we'll see how much we were able to remove or dissolve. I said, what do you mean, erase? He said, oh, it will show in the CAT scan where it erased. It means that they're going to do this. Now, we, after that, we're going to put a filter on your groin and a filter in your heart and your lungs. Anybody ever heard of a filter there? Yeah. They put one in the groin area and one in the heart, right? You got one. Okay. They said they were going to, you too? Okay, so, so you know what I'm talking. You know I'm, uh, we're going to do that. They said, well, next morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, Pastor, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a little time, but my name is Panetto, and I read some, a little bit of Hebrew. I'm not as good as he is. This, this man, I cannot even stand next to him. But the little Hebrew I know, I know that the taf is the cross symbol. It's the, in the alphabet is the taf, and you and I have shared that. Panetto is a taf. It's a T, two crosses. My name, Pane, means bread in Italian. The two crosses... And the zero is the Aleph. And I read it backward. The Aleph who died in the cross and became the bread of life, he will give you life again. I don't know how I interpret that name that way. I don't know if I was delir delirious or, or going crazy or something. But I noticed that even my name going backward, he knew me from the day I was born. And he knew that day that I needed that reassurance in my name, Panetto. And when I came out of the CT, they did the, uh, the CT scan with contract. I go back, and I'll tell you something. I sat there. They, was, they just sat me, and, and they said, well, well, we'll see what's going to happen. And we may have to go and do this uh, surgery, preparing me for surgery, shaving me to get those uh, filters. Here comes Barry. Like this. At 9 o'clock in the morning. you have someone here that will tell you that my God is alive and he doesn't choose you because you're better because you're a messianic he doesn't choose you because you're Puerto Rican or half Jew or half black or half anything he chooses you for his glory and for his name and for his purpose and he heals anyone he wants to heal I give you that news today am I writing a book no Am I going to go in a ministry collecting money for this? No. You may say, why not? Because this was about me and him. And I will live the rest of my life knowing that my Savior lives, that my Redeemer lives, and that he can restore even the most critical situations. I share this with people in the stores and stuff, and I share with people in the street. 
Some of them, the, the, well, they want to hear it. Others, they don't. But I said, hey, at least I tried. So my good news to you is this. This is Father's Day. I see a lot of fathers here. And I see mothers. I dedicate this to my friend. Because when I went and I prayed with him, I put this cloth around him and we prayed. Pastor, what you didn't know, I spied on you. I have a confession. I call my daughter. Believe me, you're not alone. <laughs> I call my daughter and said, I have Pastor Diaz. He's in the hospital. I must see him. What does he? I think he has a pinch small intestine or something of that nature. Jessica said, Really? I said, Really? I have another daughter who's also a nurse. She said, Really? Ask Jennifer. I asked Jennifer, says, how, how long? And she said, Daddy, that could be life-threatening. Mm -hmm. He may not make it go. Go. Jessica said, go, Dad. Go pray with him. I said, but they're not, they're not going to let me in. They'll let you in, Dad. My daughter, Jessica, she told me, you may not make it. I don't know. She's not a doctor. But I went because I didn't know till now that you were going to make it. But I went because God told me to go and tell you that there is hope, healing, and faith, and that it is active today. God has not deleted it. God not has not erased it. God has living proof that you and I have been there in the real door of death, and here we are. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I want you to do one thing as I leave. Look for a scripture in your Bible that talks about the Father. Today is Father's Day. Father's Day. You know what I celebrate? My father left me when I was nine years old. I never saw him again and abandoned us. But when I found my father in heaven, I still celebrate Father's Day. And I celebrate it with you today that my father loves me. And he will never leave me or forsake me. He won't leave me in the streets of Brooklyn, abandoned in a building. I saw my mom drunk and naked in the floor. I saw horrible things. But my father wrapped his hands around me and said, I have a plan for you. I have a place for you. And on this Father's Day, I dedicated to my friend, my pastor friend who I love and I cherish in my life. But I want to celebrate this day for my God who is in heaven, who is our Father. And he will never leave us or forsake us, no matter what happens, how the odds go. No matter who tells you you're going to die or not. Listen, if you tell me right now, Ray, you're going to drop dead, I'm going to give you a kiss so big. Because <laughs> I want to see my Father. Thank you so much. May God bless you. May Hashem pour out his blessing upon you on this tough Father's Day. And may the Lord of God, the, the Lord of heaven, the God of God, the, the, the Father of Yeshua HaMashiach pour out his you know what, this is what I, you know, he has a prayer shawl too. Yeah, he has with this great big old prayer shawl. God bless you. Amen. Didn't know how, ooh, wow. <laughs> we've got, we've got amplification amplic, amp, issues. Amplification issues. So I didn't know exactly how I would fit this in, but I feel like I need to fit something into this that does involve healing, miraculous healing actually. Uh, quite miraculous healing. Now I was healed. And, and Brother Ray had a lot to do with my testimony, how I, how I faced that one week of real trial. And praise God. His, he came, he prayed that day, and I knew when others came and prayed as well, I knew that I was going to be healed. But during that week, week of trial, I knew I had to gird up and fight. And as I walked the aisles of the, of the hospital, and by the way, they thought I was crazy. What are you doing up walking? Well, 
Uh, I knew every step of the way, literally every step I took, I was in prayer, I was engaged in the battle. So praise God, God renewed me, healed me, and prepared me for a difficult year of COVID nonsense. Mm. COVID nonsense, all of the issues that we had to deal with required a lot of strength from me. Everything that happened required a lot from me. Now I'm over it now. I'm over all of the effects of it. And we're moving on. Now, I'm gonna talk, talk about something that may not seem related, but in fact is related. This, this thing with Ray happened right when I was in preparation for our trip to Israel. This, tri this, this trip to Israel of 2020 was the most grueling, most difficult, but at the same time, in many ways, it was the most rewarding. Because I got to take people there that, that needed to be there. I got to do things in, in just that one week, <clears throat> because we had to abandon the trip. And just that one week, that was absolutely profound, and, and I will never forget. It was a difficult week, but yet it was powerful. Now, Israel, being there for that whole process, you showing up with the talit and praying and so on, all of that is interconnected, and I'm gonna try and connect that right now. God is preparing to heal the church. Amen. And the healing of the church that will occur is miraculous. It's going to be miraculous. It needs to be miraculous because the church is ill. Many times I speak, I speak in, a, in a negative, what you might see as a negative way about the church, Christianity. But things are negative with Christianity. And the only way I can express or address is to speak about it so I'm negative about it. But listen, God has given me a burden for Christianity. It has come to me many times in a vision, in a dream, that my responsibility, your, therefore your responsibility, is to believe that God would initiate healing in the church and that we have something to do with it, even if a small part, just one, just one bolt in an apparatus that's gonna bring redemption and healing for the church. I think we have more than just one bolt to apply. I think we're much more than that. Now, I'm going to share something that's connected, and let me just come right out and share it. So, you know something about Jewish people? Jewish people are very bold and very brash, right? <laughs> very brash. And they have no problems with asking you why. Why? Why? And so, that's just the way they are. If they don't understand, they'll confront you with that big W. Why? And so Shoshana Shilu, one year, she confronted me with the big W. Why? <laughs> and let me share with you what that why is about. We, I, stayed, I, I didn't stay with her that particular year. This was another year that I stayed over at Raphaela. I went over to, to visit with her. She wanted me to come over. She said, I want you to come over. So I went over to Shoshana Shilu's, and by the way, if you want to know who Shoshana Shilu is, her picture is the first on the way out, next to the Ethiopian Jew that's on, on the wall. So Shoshana Shilu is just in, this incredible Jewish lady, woman of faith, really, really strong in, in faith. So I, I go over and she, she kind of prepped me for what she was going to do, which was to ask me why. She prepped me, she sat me down, she gave me something to drink, a little snack, it was a Shabbat, and she said, now, you have Jewish roots. You're Bene Anusim, and they all know what Bene Anusim is. Bene Anusim is, is, is the phrase that's used for people who descended from the forcibly converted Jews, right? She said, you're Bene Anusim. I said, yeah. She says, why won't you just convert? If you know that your people were Sephardic Jews and they were forcibly converted. Why are you a Christian? Why are you doing this? Why? <laughs> so, now, I was caught unawares, but God, did, God, didn't, God wasn't caught unawares. He wasn't surprised by the, by the big why from Shoshana Shiloh. For days in advance, he prepped me, preparing in me, 
he kept, he kept pointing to me what, that my, what my ministry is really all about. How my burden is for Christianity, my burden is for the church, not for Israel. My burden for the world is not as great as it is for the church. My burden for the world has to do with the church coming to its fullness so that the world can benefit from its proper ministry, the ministry of the church. So what's wrong with the world is Christianity. Christianity needs to come to its fullness in order to be the instrument that God has prepared it to be. And we're far off. I mean, if you may not like the bluntness and the brashness of that, but it's absolutely true. Debate me on it. The church is far off from where it should be. That's my burden. And so she hits me with this big, why? Why don't you make conversion? Make aliyah, she said. So I was immediately kind of perplexed by the why when you're confronted with the big W. And then it came to me. It came to me so, so, so clear, so crisp. And I said to her, I said, yes, my father told me about this before he died. I've heard him talk about this many, many times. And he was very passionate about this. Many members in the family are also very passionate about our history. It's on all sides of my family. I said I had a cousin, I told her I had a cousin who got that DNA test, the really expensive one, and she's 95% Jewish. I said, I don't need to do a DNA test, and I'll tell you why, why I don't need to convert. God has prepared me, and I told her, God has prepared me to affront Christianity. Because of all that it has done, to Israel, one, and all that it's not doing concerning Israel. She said, what? What do you mean? I don't understand. You know, Jewish people are very blunt. What do you mean? I don't understand that. I said, well, I believe that rather than me making conversion and making aliyah, God has positioned me to address Christianity. To address the wrongness of Christianity, what they have done to the Jewish people, and what they still do to the Jewish people. They still do. They still hold the position that we replace Israel. They still hold the position that Israel is no more. God has commissioned me, I told her, given me the ministry to address that. And the only way I can do it is as a Christian. And she, she, she now the way I said it then, it was more condensed more direct, the Holy Spirit was leading that discussion, and it, it connected with her. I saw it. And from her perspective, what I said was, I can convert and become a Jew, based on my ancestry, or I can be a Christian and bring light to the Gentiles. Address the reality of where the church isn't and where it needs to be. That's my ministry, by the way, if that's my ministry, that's your ministry. Every now and again, people will get a little upset with me. Why are you always pointing out what's wrong with Christianity? Because there's so much wrong with it. If Jesus, Paul, John, Peter, were to be given a pulpit today in the landscape of Christianity, in the arena of Christianity, what do you think they will say? Let me ask an, an even more appropriate question. If John the Baptist, spirit of Elijah, were to stand before the entire span of Christianity, knowing the subsequent history of Christianity once he had died, knowing what Christianity has done, knowing that he baptized Yeshua to empower him for this work of ministry, if John the Baptist were to take a pulpit before an entire arena of Christianity, what would he say? What do you think John would say to the Christian world? I think it would <laughs> You brew the vipers. He would have a lot to say that's quote-unquote negative. Nonetheless, he would call the church to repentance, right. wouldn't he? Spirit of Elijah. He would call the church to repentance. He would point out what is wrong, of course, and then call the church to repentance. And he would say, there's a way back. Isn't that my message? Right. Yes. 
Isn't that exactly what I've been saying? I know it annoys some people. Strap in or strap out. I'm going to keep preaching it. I'm not going to stop. This is what God has, God has called me to, de, to do because there's healing that's necessary in the church. And we can pretend that Christianity is all fine, everything is hunky-dory, and let's all get along and move on, or we can stand up and proclaim the truth. Which one will you do? I know what I'm doing. Would you be standing alongside me? Would you become one voice with me? As we become that voice that calls for repentance. You know, I'm going to say this. I'm yet to construct a proper teaching on this, and I will. PowerPoint and all. The church, the church is the spirit of Elijah in these days. The church that will stand up and be bold enough to kick off the yoke of Constantinian Christianity. The church that will take a righteous stand and say we will proclaim the truth. Well, that church is Elijah. Because Elijah is to come before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Elijah is going to come not in one person, but in a committee of people. In a mass of people, people that will stand up and say, Church, you are wrong. You've been wrong. You've done wrong to the people of Israel. And you are doing wrong to the people of Israel. You need to repent and turn away from your iniquity, church, and stand on the word of God. Amen. Now, in that, what I just said is the essence of end time prophecy. Because this is going to happen. The bride... Listen, I love this. I love it. Love it. Did I say I love it? Yeah. I love this. Revelation chapter 19. Such a powerful, powerful chapter. And, and I say it time and time again. It's my favorite chapter. You've heard me say that before. At least a dozen times. Revelation chapter 19. So profound. And there's one little verse I want to draw your attention. Well, two. Maybe three. No, two. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19. The minister, or the, the minister in spirit, the angel that was ministering to John, said, don't worship me. Worship God. Worship Messiah. Worship God. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Revelation chapter 19, I think it's verse 11 or 15. But, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, or the spirit of prophecy, excuse me, is the testimony of Jesus. So in him, in that, in that reality, is the essence of prophecy. Now, I'll give you something more prophetic. Prophetic beyond anything that you can conjure up. The bride makes herself ready. The bride makes herself ready. I'll say it one more time. It's prophetically stated in Revelation chapter 19. The bride, the church, makes herself ready. No one readies her. She makes herself ready. She washes her gown. She, 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 she separates herself from Babylonian Christianity, which is about 90% of what you get out there. Babylonian Christianity. She separates herself. There's a call in Revelation chapter 9, uh, 18 to come out of that spirit. Separate yourself from Babylonian Christianity. The angel cries to come out of her. Who's the angel crying to? Not the world, not Israel, not the beast system. Who's the angel crying out to? To you, to Christianity. Come out of her, it says. Leave Babylon alone. You can go back to that Babylonian Christianity or you can come follow Jesus. That's the choices we have. The bride makes herself ready. I want you to hear that. The church is going to come to a point at some time and say, we've got to clean up our act. We've got to get our garments clean, white, linen, pure. The righteous acts of the saints, which she will put on before the wedding between her and Messiah Jesus. Revelation chapter 19. She will make, and this is what I'm talking about. I'm here saying, hey guys, there's a wedding. Be ye ready. 
There is a wedding. Get your, get your, your Christianity in order because you're not going to be a part of the wedding if you don't. That's the message. So, a, a great deal of my emphasis and, and focus in ministry is to address the Gentile church. Not as a Jew. I told you about the big why that I was confronted with by, by Shoshana Shilu, right? Why, why, why are you not converting? Why don't you just make Aliyah and get over with it? I am much more effective in Christianity for the sake of the kingdom than standing on the mountains of Israel as a Jew. You follow me? Yes. Now that resonated in her and she pulled back and she said, I, I see, Nachon, I see. Of course, the whole community knew I was going to be confronted. Well, that's just the way it is. They all knew I was going to be confronted. They also all knew what my answer was. They also all knew what my answer was. That I can be more effective on behalf of the truth of God, relative to Israel, relative to his kingdom, where I'm at right now. Yeah, I'm, I don't need to convert. I don't need to become a Jew. There was a time that I was focused on that. Yes, between the years of 1986 and 1989, I was focused on it. I was about to do it. I was about to pull the proverbial trigger, but Jesus came and I became born again in an instant. Amen. I was completely transformed and I knew that the synagogue was not for me. Amen. And that where I'm at right now is what he had in store for me. Did I know every detail of it? No. But this is where he has me. I'm going to share with you a dream, a vision, and we'll, we'll come to an end. It is about healing. The healing of the church. Amen. The bride that makes herself ready. It's a miraculous healing, and God's going to do it. Yes. My first two, two or three years of being a believer, when I was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, it was powerful. It was powerful. It was... The gift of tongues only came about four or five years later. That was powerful, but the visions, the dreams, the prophetic senses, the prophetic unctions that he was giving me was immense. He, he filled me up to the brim with understanding of what's coming. I didn't study under anyone. I didn't read any books except one, the two Babylons, which is just about the most Difficult book that you can ever read. But I never read any books on prophecy. But he filled me up with just a knowing of how things will transpire. Over the years, many people have accused me of being a, a, a conspiracy theorist. Where are they now? Silent. Why? Because they're seeing it with their own eyes. I don't toot my horn. I toot God's horn. Because he did that in me. Now, during that time of having visions, dreams, profound prophetic dreams, visionary dreams, I had a dream. Now, let me say this before I go any further. I am not a clear, cohesive, cogent dreamer. All right? My dreams are weird. My dreams are just off the wall. I'm here, this is happening, then all of a sudden, where did you come from? I don't know. But where did, it's a, my dreams are like that. They're not cogent. Some people have very cogent, clear dreams. You might be one of those people. I don't, never did. So I had a dream, and this dream was cogent. It was more than a dream. I knew in my spirit, even as I slept, that this was more than a dream. And I dreamt that I was in my old element in Trinidad, where I grew up, in the house that I grew up in, on the side of a mountain. And I'm there. And I'm there with people that I didn't know. Not friends, not family, but I'm there, I'm standing on the banister. You know what the banister is? I'm standing on the banister, and I'm facing the northern range, which is the mountain range where I lived, and I'm looking at the mountain range, the northern range, and above the top of the mountains, which I love to sit and stare at as a kid, above the top of the mountains developed a storm. It was, it was a storm, big, lightning, thunder, rolling clouds, bright light emanating from this cloud, and in the dream, I knew that I had to get out, leave the house, turn right, and head to the quarry that was at the end of the road at the beginning of the mountain. There was a quarry there 
where they effectively cut half of the mountain off. A large, large mountain, I, I, large, probably 300 feet up from the bottom of the quarry. But there was a plain, you know, where they had cut the mountain off before you get to the quarry. The plain must have been about 200, 300 feet, no, more than that. Uh, yeah, about maybe 200 yards, it's, you know, long, long field, flat field. They used, they used to play soccer and, and cricket there. And then the mountain, a sheer cut all the way to the top, two, 300 feet up was there. I used, to pl I used to play there as a kid. I was Johnny West Miller. <laughs> many falls I've had on that mountain. Many. Busted knees, busted elbows, everything else. I was, you know who Johnny West Miller is? <laughs> Who's Johnny West Miller? <laughs> Tarzan. Tarzan. I was Tarzan. I mean, literally, as a kid, you know, I would bust out of the house with some, some shorts and bareback. And I'm Tarzan. I'm swinging from vines and <laughs> living off the mangoes and everything. See you, Joyce. Uh, and swinging around like a monkey. Uh, I've taken some falls, serious falls. Now, on this, on this field where that mountain is, is where I knew I had to go. And so I came from the house, I veered right, I turned up the street to where the quarry was new in, in the dream. And there was a quarry. So I'm headed to that mountain and I'm saying, for whatever reason, we've got to get up that mountain. I knew how to climb the mountain. I knew where every vine was, every rock, every step was. So I'm headed to the mountain. For some reason, that was safety. And so the people that were with me were coming with me. And we were moving forward. And I remember interacting with the people. I said, we've got to pull together. We've got to move forward. There's a storm coming, and there's safety up the mountain. And we're moving forward. And then, suddenly in that dream, I looked down and I was dressed in white, all dressed in white. And I looked around me at the people that were around me and we were all dressed in white. And that was strange. Of course, at this time, I'm knowing it's more than a dream. We're all dressed in white. And we're all headed to this sheer cliff. And then, at the foot of this cliff, before we started ascending, I looked back in the dream. And there was a line of people going all the way back, just a, just, a, just a procession of people all the way back, and they were all dressed in white, all of them. And I said, okay, in the dream, this is interesting, but I must climb. So we went up the mountain. And halfway up the mountain, I remember looking back, and the storm was consuming everything behind. The storm had become an enveloped monster, a, a mammoth of a storm was just churning behind the crowd of people, destroying everything, and the dream came to an end. I woke up and I said, now, that was a weird dream. That was a weird dream. I also knew that God gave interpretations for dreams. I had no understanding of what the dream was. Let me say that right now. I walked around for almost a month, perhaps six weeks, perplexed about the dream. What is that dream about? In Trinidad, quarry, storm, fleeing up the mountain, crowds of people with us. There was a group of us that were being followed and many others were coming. And behind them was a devouring storm. I walked around saying, God, tell me, what is, what is that? The dream never left me. It entered into my mind. It entered into my heart. And I couldn't get it out. I needed understanding. Six weeks go by or so, and I'm at work doing mundane stuff with my hands. By the way, that's when God speaks to me the clearest. Uh, I'm doing mundane things with my hand, and suddenly I got the interpretation of the dream, just as I'm doing this. And the Spirit of God said to me, there is going to be a movement away from the Babylonian church, Christianity as we know it. Because Christianity as we know it is going to be devoured by a beast. All of this being unfolded in my mind. And that's what I kept, I sensed right away. That God was speaking clearly. That Christianity as we know it is going to be devoured. And folks, people just have, just have to come out of it. Just come out of it. Come out of that devouring monster, that storm, and ascend. Ascend, ascend to what? Ascend to God's mountain, the heights that we're called to stand upon. Moses, 
Aaron and, and Hur stood on the mountaintop while the battle was in the valley. Amalek in the valley, devouring everything until Moses held up the staff. You see, that's the dream that we, little us, little me, little you, little us, are leading others. We are, we are at the front of this movement. There are others at the front of the movement too, many others, that are leading this movement out of Christianity. Dare I say there is coming a reformation? Yes, there is coming a reformation. Are we too bold to say, are, are we too brazen to say that we're going to be a part of that reformation? Why? Why would we be too, too bold? Is it illusions of grandeur? Shouldn't we believe for great things? Yes. What is wrong with us saying we're going to stand on God's word and he's going to use us to move forward and effect change in Christianity? Healing. Greater things you will do because I go to sit with the Father. So because Yeshua is at the right hand of God, he has empowered us, equipped us to do greater things. And we ought to believe for the healing and the deliverance. Same thing. Healing, deliverance of Christianity. As I preach this message, as I, as I relate this message to you this morning concerning the testimony we heard of healing, miraculous healing. Churches today are talking about fathers, how much, how much, you, you know, what are we talking about the churches this morning? Some of you came from churches. What's the message about fathers? Uh, feel good stuff, psychological things. <laughs> because we're pathetically weak, stricken we are, stricken. And again, if John the Baptist, not even a believer in Messiah in the way that we are, in the spirit of Elijah, were to take that podium, the podium that stood before all of Christianity, he would have a few things to see. Yeah. And he would be much more, let's just say, addressing yeah. than I am. He would be much more straight to the point than I can ever be. I would be gentle compared to him. No, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, is here in us. The spirit of prophecy is in us. The actual spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, is here. And what is Jesus testifying? The church has to be reformed. He wants us to believe for reformation. Can we believe for reformation? One man took an essay, nailed it to the door of a cathedral in regards to justification by faith and brought about a massive reformation, Martin Luther. One issue was addressed. We have 20 more to address. What's wrong with believing that God can use us, not me, not any one of us, to initiate something like this? Let me say this. 40 years ago, when this ministry formed, this was the impetus of ministry. Pastor Ken labored over the Zema course. He saw that the message of the church was entirely different than what the message of the Bible actually was. And he poured himself into the study of the Bible and saw it and did what he could, the best that he could, to put together a course to illustrate what I'm saying to you. Now, we're 40, 45 years later, and I'm saying we're ready for the next step. Are we ready for the next step? Which is to proclaim this with boldness, without fear, without trepidation. Fear of what? Fear of authority that's crooked, corrupt? You know, would the, would, would the FBI come and shut us down because the things we're saying, too bold? <laughs> would they find a way to quiet us? They certainly would if they could. But are we not to stand boldly and make these declarations nonetheless? Yes, we are. We are not to be afraid of anything. Virus, IRS, FBI, CIA, DEA, none of them are to intimidate us. A massive world order that wants us to, 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 to uniformly surrender to them. Should we acquiesce to them? 
Absolutely not. Because God has commissioned us with something that's greater than anything this world can offer. And so the message is simple. To the church, you need reformation. You need healing. <laughs> you need healing. And God has provided a healer. And we're here to administer the medicine. The church will stand in these days in the spirit of Elijah. It is happening. The spirit of Elijah is not an acquiescent spirit. It is not a spirit that compromises. It's not a fearful spirit. What happened to Elijah when he exhibited some fear? God replaced him with Elisha. The ministry of Elijah, there was no room for fear. He feared Jezebel. God said, why are you here in this cave? In a very still and small voice, he said, Elijah, what are you doing? And he was taken up. Elisha broadened his shoulders, stood upright, and said, that Jezebel must go. Fearlessly, he faced her. You see, the spirit of Elijah, there's no room for acquiescence. There's no room for compromise. There's only, there's only us surging forward in power, in faith, and in strength. So, that's, that's the ministry. We support Israel. We pray for Israel. We make disciples. We preach this message of the kingdom. We do all those things that God has given us to do, but we're also prepared to advance and not remain in one place but to advance in this purpose that God has given us. Folks, God has entrusted you to bring a dimension of healing to Christianity. The time has come for the bride to make herself ready, to put away all the things of the past that are all encumber encumbersome. He has, he has brought the church to this wonderful place. That's the message. That's your message, in case you didn't know it. So each of you, each of you, you have a choice set before you. Do I follow that guy? Is he really my pastor? The things he's saying, what in the world? I can barely stand to hear him. Yeah. If you're called to be here, this is the message. This is our message. Yes. Him. And the pastor knew the second we walked in. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> I know that the Lord let him see that. And we've been through all this journey for nearly 15 years. And out of the two of us, I am the researcher. I am the one who's more passionate and because I love history and all of that. But it's not because of me. I understood that the Lord had a purpose for that to happen. And I did go to uh, many identity crises, just like the pastor did, and all of you a were, sudden you I'm were, asking. You were, you were uh, Rita Marley at one time, I understand. I'm sorry? You were Rita Marley at one time. Yes, at some point. Yes, I was. That's another story. <laughs> but don't worry, I was one but of the But not because I wanted to time. be Rita Marley, but because I danced to the groove of Rita Marley. Anyways. <laughs> But uh, Kelvin was Bob Marley. I was one of the, yeah, of the I3. Yeah. But that's not the point. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> uh, but the point is that he has said something so important because I went through that healing process. I myself went through the healing process. I was, uh, I grew up as an ultra Catholic. <laughs> My husband and my father, the only thing that he was missing was the cap, the Pope cap too, you know. And, you know, but that's what happens with many people who have come from, you know, the Bene Anusim and all of that. And I went through that identity crisis and 
I was one of the people who went to Israel, and I had no idea what the Lord was about to do. I had no idea the position that the Lord was going to put me in at an individual, you know, uh, stage, not having to do with my husband. Of course, we have a calling as a, as a couple, but I too was healed from not knowing who I was. And I, I too was healed of knowing that if I can call myself a Bnei Anusim and if the Lord allow me to all this research and all this genealogy and all of this music things, the passion that I feel is because he wants me at a place like this, a, a church like this, a congregation like this, to not compromise. And I cannot tell you, ever since I came back from Israel and the things that the Lord has allowed me to do from recording with Israeli singers, uh, Messianic and non-Messianic, Orthodox Jewish, uh, it, he has only done one thing. The less I compromise, the more he reaffirms my faith in where I am at and why am I doing what I'm doing, why he is allowing me to do what I am doing. And so when the pastor was saying this, it's just my heart is pounding and wanting to tell you that, yes, I can, I can confirm and give testimony of what he is saying. Because the Lord couldn't bring a, brought us to a, a better place, he would understand where we are going through or what we are going through from where we're coming from, uh, what, where we're coming from. And also, one more thing is that through all this research that I've done and everything and having to do with the Inquisition, which is something that the pastor talked about on Friday, I, 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 I don't know, I can't have a PhD on that matter because I've read so many books and so many things. One day while I was reading something, um, this thought came upon me and I, I even told my husband, you know, I think that the Lord allowed that to happen for one reason. Because all of us that are in this other side, the Caribbean, being brought up in the, you know, as Christians and all of that, some way or another, I met my Lord through Yeshua. And would have not been that way, I probably, when I started discovering all of those things, I probably would have gone nuts and just, you know, convert. <laughs> just, you know. And so, but what my father, the fear of the Lord through Yeshua that my father taught me, that was there inside of me. And inside of my husband, uh, he grew up, uh, his testimony is a little different than mine. He was Pentecostal. <laughs> All the way. The good ones. <laughs> but yes, I, I, I just want, I wanted to share that I confirm what the pastor is saying that's the same calling that I feel, that we feel. My husband, I know that he's there with me. And that this congregation is very much so called for that. I love your testimony and I long for you to share it with the congregation. So the spirit of Elijah. Yes, I'm going to put that message together more concisely. The church in these days, the church that comes out of the Babylonian Christianity that we talk about, the church will become Elijah before the great and awesome day of the Lord. The message of Elijah, repent, turn away, return, which is the message of Elijah, will be not for Israel in these days, but be for the church. And that's why he's raising up people like us in the church, to announce that, to exclaim that, to proclaim the, and be in the essence, the spirit of Elijah. This is the big one. My Malachi spoke about this, that Elijah come in before the great and awesome day of God, prepare ye the way, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So, it's gonna be a journey. It's gonna be a journey. God preserved me a year ago. I, I doctor said I was gonna die. Everything in me said, you're going to die. I was prepared to lay down at the airport in Tel Aviv, full on my stomach. Satan wanted to convince me that I was going to die. God kept me for this purpose so that I can stand together with you as we stand in the spirit of Elijah in this day, in this awesome day. 
The spirit of Elijah will be great encouragement to Israel. Great encouragement to Israel. Once Elijah takes his position, once he takes his stand, he will bring encouragement to Israel. And I think Israel is aware of that. Prophetically in the Jewish community, they are expecting Elijah to show up. They were looking for him to show up. Every Pesach, where is Elijah? We have a seat for him, where is he? Prophetically, in the Jewish world, Elijah is going to show up and he's going to announce the day of Moshiach. And he will be a strength and encouragement for us, they believe. And yes, it's going to happen. It is happening. It's going to happen more so because the bride, spirit of Elijah, will make herself ready.